Thank you all very much for coming. My name is David Wilkins. For those of you I haven't met, which I think is a lot of you, because I think we have a lot of first year students here. I am the faculty director of something called the Center on the Legal Profession, uh, which its goal is to do exactly what it sounds like, which is to try to uh, both study and teach about the profession and to give students an idea of what are the opportunities and possibilities for uh, professional careers, uh, but also to talk about uh, the uh, complex and interesting issues that lawyers often find themselves in the middle of. And my guess is today we're going to have a good opportunity to examine some of those uh, issues. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, this is uh, being uh, both recorded and live streamed. The only people on camera are Viet and me, uh, and students' voices also will not be recorded so that, uh, except to the extent they get picked up by our lavalier mics, these are the only mics that are hot. Um, and that's why uh, when we get time for questions, and I promise we are going to save a very good amount of time for questions from all of you, and Viet has generously agreed to answer any question that people have for him here. Uh, I will repeat the questions because there are a couple of thousand people uh, on the live stream. And my guess is many more will uh, watch after that. Um, which is an indication of why I'm very delighted that we're having this event here today. Um, let me just say a little bit by way of background. Uh, I first met Viet as on the very first day of his law school experience in uh, 1990 in civil procedure in the old Harvard Law School, which means there were 140 people in his civil procedure class. I think we were in Langdell North or something like that. Uh, every I had a giant seating chart in front of me just with names on them. We hadn't even figured out how to pick pictures on them. And uh, in typical Harvard Law School fashion, I was going to call on a student to recite the facts of the case, which I think was Goldberg versus Kelly at the time. And I looked down on my, which it probably still is for many of you today, <laughs> and, and I looked down and I saw Din and I said, uh, Ms. Din, please, and it turned out Ms. Din sheepishly, there was a silence and then a sheepish hand, I, I'm Mr. Din. <laughs> and that's how we first met. Um, we became quite close that year because as some of you know, uh, and we'll only talk a little bit about this in general now because we have many more issues to cover, but I think it's well worth knowing. Viet has an incredible personal story. Uh, he and his family literally escaped via a boat from Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. Uh, he had arrived in this country basically, uh, and worked uh, picking vegetables uh, in his early life. Uh, first, maybe in Texas before moving to California. Where was Oregon. it? First? Oregon, before moving to uh, California, where he was, quite frankly, discovered by a teacher who said, you know, you are really bright. You should have higher aspirations than he probably thought he could ever have for himself. And he ends up uh, coming to Harvard College and doing exceedingly well, and then coming to Harvard Law School. But by the time we met, his sister, who had stayed behind when his mother and several of his siblings had left on a boat, uh, had stayed behind because his father had been imprisoned, and she wanted to stay there with him. And he, uh, she stayed, and eventually her father escaped, and eventually she escaped but she was caught in a Hong Kong refugee camp. And so at the time we met, and I'm not quite sure, I think I was having lunch with all my students kind of in groups of 10 or something like that. And we talked and he told me the story and I said, well, let me see what we can do to help. And so we spent much of the next year uh, enlisting people who we knew who were in the Bush administration, the H.W. Bush administration at the, time, uh, Bill Alford, who 
uh, Viet Just Met, who wasn't unfortunately able to be here, also chipped in as did several other professors. And we managed to uh, get his sister out of that refugee camp. And we've stayed uh, in touch ever since. Uh, I think it's fair to say we don't agree on everything, and that may come out here. We have different views on a lot of different kinds of things, uh, but he is remains one of the most extraordinary people that I've met. And uh, when we were in touch around the death of Charles Ogletree, which was also a mentor of Viet's when he was here uh, and was a dear friend of mine, I said to him, Viet, you know, if you're ever around, you should come and talk to students about some of the issues that you have been dealing with. I'm sure there will be tremendous interest and the fact that there's kind of standing room only in the back of the room uh, shows that there is indeed. Um, so as I said, I promise there'll be lots of Time for questions, and Viet has graciously agreed to answer any question uh, or at least engage with any question that anybody has. But we're going to start out uh, by talking a little bit about how he got to his current position as the general counsel at Fox, and then some of the issues that he's confronted there and what the role of the general counsel is in those issues. And this is partly my interest and our interest in the civil, uh, the center and the legal profession is to talk about what is the role of lawyers, uh, particularly general counsels, which is a role that there's been, quite frankly, very little, even today, attention to, uh, especially in law schools. And yet, I'm going to argue, is one of the most important roles in the legal profession uh, because general counsels sit at a very interesting place between law and business. And I know we have a lot of uh, members of the Association of Law and Business here, uh, between uh, internal facing in the company and external facing in the world. Uh, they encounter many, many important public issues. And the question is, what's the role of the general counsel in those sorts of issues? Because they are not the, they're not the, owners and managers of the business, they're not the clients, and yet they play a very influential role. So uh, with that in mind, Biet, I, I'm going to start here. Before you took the role in Fox, you, you had had pretty much every job anyone could have in the legal profession. You'd been a law clerk, including on the Supreme Court for Justice O'Connor. Uh, you had worked in the uh, Department of Justice as the uh, Assistant you know, uh, Attorney General. Uh, for the Office of Legal Policy. You had been a law professor for 20 years at Georgetown. You had started your own law firm, which was kind of the first of what we now see several of, which are kind of boutique, uh, Supreme Court-focused or appellate-focused litigation uh, boutiques. And you had then uh, negotiated the merger of that boutique into one of the biggest, most successful law firms in the country, Kirkland and Ellis, many of you know. So after all that, why did you decide you were interested in being a general counsel? <laughs> Great question. Thank you very much, David, for uh, uh, being here. I just want to say, since you brought up the, the, uh, the story of uh, my my uh, origin story here at Harvard Law School. I owe everything to this place, owe a, a whole lot of it to you. Um, you know, it was just, if you don't, if you know immigration law or refugee law, you know that people who come into a country is not entitled to any rights because it's a, there's an inclusion doctrine. Uh, uh, and so, and so, uh, my sister's being held in a detention camp. Uh, the, uh, just in the new territories in Hong Kong, and there was no way for us to get any legal recourse. I remember Bill Alford hooked us up with a, a Queen's counsel and a the solicitor in the Hong Kong, talked to the, 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 the David and Anne Marie, who were very, very helpful navigating the, the, the non-legal advocacy, if you will, and it was their idea that I wrote a, I sent in an op-ed piece in the New York Times to Anthony Lewis, who uh, has great ties to this place, who, who, who then uh, uh, 
um, Skype has better to publish it. And, you know, that we worked with television networks and, uh, and the like, and David and Anne-Marie guided us in every single step of the way. The day that we landed in Hong Kong with the Dateline NBC news crew was the day that the Hong Kong government a release her from the detention camp in order to the process her as a refugee. So, you know, very early on, David at Harvard and all the people, Deborah Anker, who's an immigration uh, not, not expert, you know, that navigated the, U, the U.S. immigration process, uh, taught me early on that, you know, what we learn in the classroom can be amplified by a whole lot of other mechanisms to uh, uh, do law. Uh, what we advocate in the courtroom can be uh, augmented with a whole lot of other uh, uh, other tools in order to solve clients' problems uh, and to get to the uh, to the desired uh, result. And so, in all of those various uh, 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 stops along the way, uh, and I do admit <laughs> it has been uh, a bit of peripatetic journey. Uh, that uh, in each one of those, you know, we, I called on the same essential set of skills, which is the critical thinking, the logical uh, the advocacy, not through the uh, not, not through um, uh, uh, fist uh, pounding, but through the uh, exploration and exposition, uh, and uh, ultimately uh, to solve problems using a whole, a whole variety of tools uh, that uh, that are at your at your disposal. Uh, by the time um, uh, I joined the company as chief legal con uh, officer, I had been on the board for 15 years. Uh, so I joined the board of the company in various iterations. It started out as News Corporation, then spun off to uh, News Corp, and we became 21, uh, 21st Century Fox. And then we sold two thirds of that, that company to, the, to uh, Disney. Uh, and then we were starting the Fox Corporation, which is now, which is uh, uh, the third iteration of the company, but with a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my good friends whom I got to know on the board uh, became CEO, and uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, asked me to come and uh, and take up the, uh, the current position. You're right that it is a bit of a deviation from the journey that I had before, which if you notice, it's a multi-client, multi-disciplinary, multi-ventures. I had a lot of many, uh, many fingers and many, uh, many pots. Uh, and it is a bit of a uh, difference because you focus into one corporation, one client, one set of issues. Uh, but it was very exciting because we were building it from scratch. Uh, and we were building it uh, together as friends, as colleagues, uh, 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 together as a focused uh, uh, operation. And so it's a, it's a, uh, it was a very natural uh, 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 professional move for me. And it's also personal. My mom had passed away about a year before, and I wanted to be mo moved back to be closer to my dad, who's now 92 and thriving. And that's, uh, that to me, one of the best decisions I made. Uh, uh, and so it's a, it's a mix of both personal and, uh, uh, and professional. Now that it's five years on, um, um, my ultimate boss, uh, Rupert Murdoch, is, uh, has announced that he is uh, uh, retiring from the, uh, from the company. We also had our independent lead, independent director uh, uh, retiring from the company. We thought it was uh, uh, time for me to go back to my roots as a, uh, a multi-venture, multi-disciplinary, multi-client uh, 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 journey. And uh, now that the company is well-established. So Viet, I, I, that multidisciplinary, multi-facing, multifunctional idea is one I want to pick up on, which I think will lead us into some of the substantive discussion. That is, um, I said general counsel is a unique role because of where it sits, but often, and this was the case with you, you had multiple hats. So in other words, you were the chief legal and compliance officer, but you were also the chief policy officer. You were also head of government relations and public relations. And you also sat in as a member of what I think is called the office of the chairman. And can you say a few words about how you think about those multiple roles, particularly the aspect of those roles that are legal on the one hand, right? If you think of yourself, oh, I'm the general counsel or the chief compliance officer, that sounds very legal in ways that the students I think can understand. But when you start talking about public relations, government affairs, uh, strategy, all those other things, and how did you, what, what are the lines between where you are as a lawyer and where you are in these other rules 
And how is that in turn distinguished from the people who are making the substantive policy, business decisions, editorial content, whatever, for the network itself? Right. And so uh, Fox Corporation uh, is a bit more than Fox News. Uh, we have the Fox Broadcasting uh, Company. We have uh, uh, the Fox Television stations. We have this uh, direct to the consumer service called Tubi. Uh, which is a free ad-supported uh, uh, streaming uh, uh, service. But the Fox, the core of Fox is the Fox Network, which brings you the NFC football uh, 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 every single week. Uh, unfortunately, this last, uh, this last week, the Eagles did not comply with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with our programming needs. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, and, then, and, and of course, of that, it, that includes Fox News and, uh, and Fox Business. Fox Corporation, our corporate uh, uh, entity, oversees all of these business units, but uniquely each of the business units themselves are overseen by their own management tools. So we have a CEO of Fox News, we have a CEO of Fox Sports, we have a CEO of Fox Entertainment, we have a CEO of Tubi, uh, we have a CEO of the Fox Television uh, uh, stations, so that all of these units are run uh, locally by the, the business uh, uh, unit heads. And among the various roles that, uh, uh, that roll up to me, uh, we also have key uh, 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 colleagues. So for example, uh, the general counsel who's head of all legal is uh, Jeff Taylor, uh, uh, who was here in 90, uh, graduated in 1991, uh, was a career uh, prosecutor and uh, uh, was U.S. Attorney for uh, the District of District of Columbia. Uh, so very, very capable uh, uh, lawyer. Before that, he was uh, the WGC at GM, before we enticed him with palm trees and beaches uh, 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 and fast cars. Um, and then our chief underneath him, our head of litigation and uh, uh, chief compliance and ethics officer, again, ultimately rolling up to me, but he's in he uh, oversees all uh, uh, ethics decision as well as litigation is another former U.S. attorney for the District of Nevada, Nick Trutanich. He was also Deputy Attorney General of Nevada. So we have very capable people doing all of their various uh, the function. We have a head of government affairs in Washington, D.C. who's very, very capable. Uh, and, you know, and uh, uh, previously he was the uh, chief of staff to, to then Senator Biden for a number of years. Uh, and now uh, uh, he's succeeded by, uh, by another colleague. Uh, and so we have all of these teams that are very, very capable doing their, the, the, doing, doing their jobs. And I, my job essentially is to help Lachlan uh, be the decider in chief. He is the chief executive officer and executive chairman. Um, he bears the burden uh, and responsibility of making all decisions for the, uh, for the company, obviously feeding up through the business unit heads as well as the staff that, uh, that he has uh, uh, at corporate. Uh, so anything that's legal, that compliance, uh, government affairs, obviously uh, 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 rolls up through uh, uh, to me, and uh, and I report to that to uh, uh, to Lachlan. Uh, the one thing that I am very very cognizant of, and our lawyers are very cognizant of, is not to misuse our position into a into a uh, um, uh, into a leverage point for business and or, or other decisions. I think one of the key, uh, one of the key uh, issues when you are a lawyer functioning in a business is quite often one uses your one's legal position as a way to impose one's will through the business unit. You know, that, that to me is a, um, not abuse, uh, a misuse of the legal function and your core competency as a lawyer. If you have a strategic uh, no, 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 no view, if you have a business point of view, by all means contribute to that. You know, there's nobody has a uh, monopoly on good thinking, but don't say that this has to be done this way because I'm a lawyer and I insist you do it this way. And so I think that we're, we're we, at least our organization is very mindful uh, that we don't misuse our legal authority uh, uh, into uh, encroaching into other areas. We don't, you know, that means we all participate in all decisions because that's it's very collaborative and it should be, uh, but there's no, there's no insistence that I'm a lawyer, therefore it has to be done this way. At times, it has to be, you know, when it is a legal, when it is a compliance, when it is a, the, uh, the, the, a liability question, then one has to put one foot down as a lawyer and say, 
you cannot do this, and that, that and that word is law, because otherwise uh, significant consequences uh, will follow. Uh, but often uh, we're talking about uh, we're talking about business decisions, and we're all bringing uh, uh, in it together, bringing different perspectives, bringing different uh, uh, considerations, uh, uh, and that's that's I think that's the key point uh, that uh, your question gets at is how do you as a how do I as a business person know when to contribute to a business decision as, as opposed to how I, as a lawyer, will insist on something doing a, a certain way because the law requires it or because uh, not, not doing it another way would uh, uh, not impose unacceptable uh, risk of legal or, uh, uh, or other liability. So Viet, this brings us to, I think, an issue that every one of the students knows, and that's put you in the, uh, both in the news and maybe in the hot seat a little bit, and that's the Dominion uh, voting litigation and the kind of penumbra around it. Uh, because here you've got something that is both, on the one hand, legal, it's a lawsuit that's been brought against your clients, uh, but it also implicates things that are at the core of what the business model of Fox News is, uh, how Fox News uh, exercises its editorial judgment. Um, and all of these things are wrapped together in this lawsuit, which presumably as a lawyer, you have tremendous, I mean, you are the chief lawyer running the litigation strategy, and you are also a member of this larger management team. And so, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, obviously, the, there was a lot of publicity around this lawsuit. There was an $800 million settlement eventually around this lawsuit. There was a lot of discussion about what that meant about the underlying conduct. $785 million. I'm but, sorry. But, but, you know, <laughs> no, 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 who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, um, so the two, uh, two distinctions which you've made, which is yes, uh, in the conduct of litigation, the backward looking liability at the uh, ascription uh, I, as the, the, the uh, as the chief legal officer, you know, oversees the entire litigation. We aided by obviously a very capable uh, 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 set of lawyers, you know, uh, Jeff and Nick, who I've, who I've mentioned before. But we have a very capable general counsel of Fox News, Bernard Gruder, who was general counsel of Harpo Production uh, mm -hmm. uh, before uh, Oprah Winfrey's uh, the company, and he has. Uh, and uh, the deputy general counsel there who's a uh, litigation partner at Kirkland and Ellis. So we have a very good deep bench in-house. And of course, we have at one count hundreds of outside lawyers, you know, the, probably the best trial lawyer uh, uh, in the country, Dan Webb. And yeah, uh, I'm biased, but clearly the, the best uh, uh, appellate lawyer in the country, uh, certainly the, the now and of his generation, Paul Clement. And so there was this whole, uh, 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 the whole uh, uh, litigation uh, team. Uh, our thesis was very simple. Our thesis was very, very straightforward. We are in the news business, and the six weeks following the, uh, the November 9th elections uh, of uh, 2020 were a incredibly newsworthy uh, six weeks. Why? Because you have the sitting president of the United States contesting the result of an election that he lost and hiring lawyers to go to court in order to challenge the initial the, the, uh, uh, election results and asserting that he, at the end of the day, will have enough electors to overturn the election. And why do I say six weeks? Because by our laws, December 15th is when the electors have to be certified by the state legislatures, uh, legislatures in order to have the House of Representatives uh, recognize it. So it's a very discreet period of time with what I consider to be incredibly newsworthy, uh, incredibly newsworthy event. And we as a news, news organization would not be doing our jobs. We have not only the responsibility, but the duty to cover those allegations. It was a live ball and it was, uh, 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 it was hotly, uh, 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 hotly uh, uh, contested. Um, we knew we were right in the, uh, uh, in the law. The uh, trial judge uh, put us in a situation increasingly where 
it was very obvious that we were not able to win the trial. Uh, I had, a, uh, but we were very confident we would prevail on, on appeal. And as the judge compounds error upon error, we would get more and more confident in our ultimate uh, 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 ultimate uh, chances of prevailing on uh, on appeal because at some point it became not just a matter of reversible error it called into the fundamental fairness uh, the, and integrity of the Delaware uh, the civil justice system. We had a situation whereby I had Dan Webb, you know, threatening to commit suicide in, in his uh, 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 in his hotel room because he sees no way to win this at trial. And I've got Paul Clement doing cartwheels uh, in his hotel room saying, wow, I'm gonna be the hero, you know, winning this case back for the company and for, uh, and for the First Amendment and American uh, democracy. Uh, one example, for example, was uh, the judge uh, ruled that we cannot prove falsity. We cannot prove falsity because the election clearly was won by President Biden. No one disputes that, uh, but that, was, that wasn't our argument. Our argument is, is the truth of falsity of the fact that we cover the allegations as allegations. There was no question in our mind that the president was making these allegations. He's doing on TV, on our air and others. There's no question that Rudy Giuliani was you know, making these allegations. There's no question that Sidney Powell were making these allegations. And we as a news organization had a duty to cover those allegations. And so the truth of falsity is not the truth of falsity of the allegations, but the truth of falsity of the fact that they made the allegations. And that to me is a critical, critical conceptual and legal mistake, the conflation of the two that led the judge to really, uh, I would say, uh, illogical the, the holdings that we cannot mention the First Amendment, for example, in our, uh, in our trial presentation. We cannot mention the word newsworthiness in our, the, in our trial presentation. And so, and so those are the kind of things that really hamstrung Dan's ability to present and ultimately to defend the case uh, before a jury. Because we, are, we were confident of our position on appeal, the more these errors compound, the more cartwheels Paul Clement did because his job becomes a lot, a lot easier. But it also meant that we're gonna have three to four months of just utter pain with all our witnesses uh, not, not being uh, not presented in court and Dan Webb not being able to do, the, to do his job. Uh, and so, the, uh, and you mentioned that we had 250 reporters uh, in, the, the, in the courtroom because it was, very, it was a very, very uh, 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 hotly uh, covered uh, uh, controversy. Um, and so ultimately, even though we, uh, we were confident, I still am confident, we as organization are still confident in the, the legal uh, arguments and legal strategy. Uh, the, uh, the business decision was made uh, to um, save the organization from the cultural and uh, uh, reputational cost of going through this very long and, uh, uh, and hard fought uh, uh, trial, especially, especially we are walking into an early primary season of another hotly contested and very, uh, uh, and very exciting uh, electoral process. You, you see the you know, the, the primary season doesn't start this early normally, but it does. And who do we have as the leading Republican uh, candidate? The same guy who was contesting the, 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 uh, the 2020 uh, election, right? And so, and so the business decision is to, you know, take the pain so that we can do our job in the next cycle or to, uh, to cover the, 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 the newly launched uh, presidential election of, uh, of 2024. And so uh, that's as clear as I, uh, as I can make it in terms of how our thinking uh, go, went and still goes. It also goes to your first point uh, uh, or uh, the, your repeating point, uh, David, is that my job as a lawyer is to give the clearest legal advice, make the best legal judgment, hire the absolute best lawyers to advance our case uh, in court incidentally, to defend the First Amendment of the United States and our constitutional democracy. Not small, uh, not, not small, not beer here. But, but my job ends there to a certain point, and a business decision has to be made as to whether or not the principle is worth the cost to the institution. And, and, so, and so there are limits to the legal, to the legal position, there are limits to the, the, uh, to the business judgment. Where, what I said before is what I think would be a misuse of power is for me to say, I'm the lawyer, I insist on going to trial, you know, without regard to the business implications, because that's clearly 
a overreach of the legal position, even though we thought we would ultimately win. So uh, thank you for that. Um, one of the things you said there that I, my guess is, again, and we're going to go to questions pretty shortly. I've just got a couple more things I want to ask is, of course, uh, about the First Amendment and about it, the effect on democracy. And that was, of course, one of the big issues uh, that people have talked about, particularly in light of what happened in January 6th. And one of the questions about Fox News that my guess is, is in one sense editorial, but in one sense maybe also legal, particularly with respect to the role of the general counsel, is what is the line between reporting on the news and the news reporting division of which you could say, you know, what are the results of the election, so to speak, mm -hmm. and the editorial content and the uh, editorialization of Fox News hosts. Yeah. And as a general counsel, presumably there must be legal constraints around both of those things, but they're not necessarily the same thing. And how do you, as a general counsel, what is your role particularly with respect to the second of these things, no. because I think that was the one probably that engendered the most attention and controversy around this issue. Right, right. Uh, first of all, I do want to make a distinction between uh, you know, the, the post-election coverage and the January 6th uh, uh, coverage. I think that all of, with all the congressional hearings and everything else, everybody has been uh, very clear that the, the Fox was uh, uh, very clear in its coverage and very responsible in its uh, 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 in its air, both in terms of opinion as well as uh, uh, as well as in in coverage. January sixth was an abomination of uh, American democracy. Full stop. Period. We call it that, and, and every right thinking American should be uh, should be saying uh, saying the same thing. The um, the the bigger question uh, you raise is what are the safeguards both in terms of prevention as well as uh, remediation do we have around uh, editorial voice, especially as it, as it uh, uh, turns into uh, potential liability. Every single reporter, every single online uh, uh, and on-air uh, talent and all of, their, uh, all of their staff goes through regular First Amendment uh, 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 and uh, journalism, basic journalism uh, 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 training, both in terms of actual malice in terms of the law, in terms of best practices. Um, and we do this with editorial, with, uh, with uh, uh, the media lawyers, and with outside counsel. And it's like painting a ship. You just keep on doing it, and then you keep revising and reiterating the, 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 the training, and you keep on doing it for the entire uh, the, the, the core of people who are responsible what goes on to our air. The, the law is very clear that it is the speaker's intent that is at issue in uh, a, uh, in a uh, uh, trial on libel where truth or, fa or falsity is at issue or actual malice is at issue, not the entire corporate uh, intent because you know, we're a company of 10,000 people. What I think you know, in, uh, in the heart of my heart really shouldn't matter what Maria Bartiromo thinks is the truth and, the, uh, that, uh, and, the, and her reporting, that's what really matters. So truly, it's just the, the speaker and her immediate staff of reporting to do their, their, their work as journalism is what, the, the, is what counts. One of the unfortunate things that uh, happened in Delaware was the judge ordered no relevance review. And so if you can imagine litigation whereby you just throw in search, search terms mm -hmm. and the judge says, nobody reviews anything, just get the data and dump it to the other side. You've got 25 million documents flowing, floating out there. Probably half, at least half, maybe 70% of it is completely irrelevant to the case. But now everybody's emails, everybody's, uh, the, uh, everybody's uh, the text, including text dealing with how we cover the news in other areas are now exposed to the world. That's why you have 250 reporters, because you know we are navel-gazing 
on the industry and there's no better navel gaze than read other people's texts <laughs> and just put them out there as a, uh, the, the, in order to uh, in order to feed the uh, the gossip uh, uh, beast and so pretty quickly uh, i think the the, the process uh, the court lost control of the uh, of the media uh, circus to our detriment uh, and it severely affected our ability our journalists ability to do their job in an honest and earnest way trusting the privacy and integrity of their uh, uh, of their own work besides the training there you know we of course trust primarily the reporters and the on air uh, and the on air people that is their primary job no amount of legal review no no amount of supervision will substitute for quality and integrity in the reporting uh, 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 process. And each person has that uh, uh, obligation to make sure that uh, what he or she uh, puts on air, writes in print, is of quality and integrity, and we can, uh, we can stand uh, behind it. There's a difference, of course, between news and opinion. All of our show hosts, it started out prime time, 8 to 11, now extends from, looks like from uh, 7 o'clock after Brett Bear ends all the way through the uh, gut belt at, the, uh, the, at uh, uh, 11 or midnight. You know, those are what we consider to be our, our opinion, uh, uh, opinion shows where they comment on uh, and editorialize on the, the events of the day. That to me is understood as opinion, uh, is uh, protected as political uh, uh, expression at the highest level of, uh, uh, of the constitution. And so in many ways, uh, the Constitution gives you a better room in order to participate in democracy through opinion. The day part, we report as news, and obviously there is a higher obligation to no, 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 verify the facts, check the news, and the like. The blend between the two and what our hosts say in the air, that itself, that what, what we call editorial uh, no, judgment, editorial selection, that itself is an opinion. Right, that that in of itself is a uh, is a deliberate choice uh, to participate in American democracy in a particular way. You know, if the entire media, uh, the uh, the uh, mainstream, uh, the industry is taking one view, our deliberate editorial choice is to take a different, slightly different view, and we we say we are the center right. Uh, network, we will select stories based upon that point of view that happens to be, in our belief, coincide with American uh, America's view, but uh, irrelevant because we want to fill that marketplace that is severely underserved, uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and that has worked uh, uh, because you know it is it is the uh, the most popular not only news but the uh, uh, cable network in uh, in America for 20 years uh, running, uh, and it is a deliberate editorial choice. That in itself is protected by the first uh, by the uh, by the First Amendment, and so just as the New York Times chooses to go a different way, just as the Washington Post chooses to go a different way, just as CNN, if anybody still watches it, chooses to go a different way. <laughs> Sorry, that was snarky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go to questions from the audience, uh, but I have one last thing that builds on exactly what you said. Because there was no on-air host uh, whose uh, opinion was more amplified and also whose emails were more exposed than Tucker Carlson. And Tucker Carlson eventually uh, was fired from Fox. And so you're the general counsel. I cannot imagine that that decision would have happened without it coming to your desk. And while many of the things we've been talking about, you've been critiqued from the left, I'd say there's been a fair amount of criticism from the right about the firing of Tucker Carlson. And how does that fit in with what you just talked about? And in particular, again, what's the role of the general counsel in making that decision? Right, and, and the way I will answer it, I apologize with just a little of a clarification. Okay. Tucker has not been fired. He remains on contract with us and being paid very handsomely by us. <laughs> and his contract, uh, uh, his contract uh, has a clause that is very uh, common in uh, media contract. It's a pay or play contract, which is that we as the network has the option whether or not to put him on air. The only consequences of us not putting him on air is we pay him to be hanging out in Maine or, 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 or in Florida. 
and so and so and so and so we you know as a you know as the the lawyer we made the decision that was the proper way to handle the, 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 to handle the situation it continues to be the, uh, uh, to be the case obviously what goes on our air uh, is not my decision it is a core editorial decision that's made by Suzanne Scott our CEO by the way uh, the, the only I think still no 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 somebody else joined but you know certainly the most powerful and effective woman uh, executive in the news business, and she's ex incredibly, uh, incredibly good at what uh, at what she does. She makes a decision who goes on air, who uh, uh, who doesn't. The kind of personnel decision that sh that she and and uh, uh, and Lachlan Murdoch, the CEO of the company, make together. That's core business and editorial uh, uh, decision. My job is to execute it from a legal perspective. How best to uh, uh, to handle the the uh, 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 the the and execute uh, uh, the decision. And you know, one thing to make clear. <laughs> There's been some really bad reporting, both by journalists and one author, that somehow Tucker's uh, no, 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 not appearing on air was a quid pro quo for the no, for the Dominion settlement. Absolutely untrue. Never could be entered the conversation. Never part of the no, no, uh, uh, of the settlement. Both we and Dominion have uh, uh, said it on the record repeatedly. I think this is just a the complete fabrication of. Uh, by journalists trying to look for a story when there 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 wasn't there, or one there, uh, in terms of the, the actual decision, obviously Suzanne and uh, uh, and Lachlan have uh, spoken elsewhere regarding uh, 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 their decision, uh, but it follows the same train of thought as I said before. We are getting ready to cover a very long and very contentious uh, uh, presidential uh, cycle with a whole lot of stuff going on around the world around the world, literally, Russia, Ukraine, Middle East, China, just everywhere. And the same leading Republican candidate that we had just four years ago, who still doesn't believe that the, uh, the, the president won the election. And so, and so I think that, the, uh, I think that uh, Suzanne wanna make sure that we have a, a very good uh, slate going into this uh, season. And uh, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, I think Jesse coming into seven o'clock is, uh, is a welcome addition. The rejiggering of the uh, lineup has been, uh, uh, has been positive. The early returns are good in terms of ratings and more importantly, uh, the viewer satisfaction. So I, I think the, uh, these, things, these things are hard, uh, um, you know, uh, risk-based and reward-based decisions that uh, uh, in many ways uh, is not in my core competency, but it's for, for the executives who, uh, uh, who uh, make these. But, but, you know, these are hard decisions. There's no question about it. Tucker was not only the most popular person on our network, he's the most popular television personality, period, you know, on, 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 in the air. And the, the ability to take him off the air, you know, everybody knew had some consequences. So the floor is open. Please. Um, so, so Viet, sorry, oh, yeah, if I'm you sorry. don't mind, I, I'm just yeah. going to repeat the question. It's such, it's such a good question. I had to jump into it. <laughs> so, the, so the question was, if Fox has had for a long time owned the kind of center-right audience, they're now new networks even further to the right. How does that affect not just the business model, but I think you excellently pointed out your legal risk tolerance for competing for that market? Yeah, yeah. Um, the risk tolerance doesn't change uh, because you know that's that's you know I think that's uh, uh, regardless of who your competitors are, how much competition you uh, you do, you have to make your own risk tolerance as to what's right and what's the, the, what's acceptable. Um, the motivation is you know is more subtle, right? Are there more subtle pressures to the, uh, to move away from your lane? Are uh, are there more subtle motivations to cut corners? Uh, the, the, and the like, even though our tolerance doesn't change, doesn't mean that the, doesn't mean that we don't recognize the facts on the ground when you're running full speed with competitors chasing you that you might you might be cutting corners a little faster than the, than you would the, the, you would otherwise. I kind of I kind of like that to make sure that our brand, our company, and our people remain focused and competitive. Uh, you know, I like to say uh, the, the, that there's nothing that focuses the mind like the, the, uh, than an arrow pointing at your head. 
you know, if somebody is, you know, when you're getting really motivated is when you're in competition. Uh, that's why we play sports. Uh, and, and having competition both from the left as well as from the, uh, from the right uh, uh, means that uh, we have more participants into the public uh, conversation. And unlike a winner take all market, this to me is the more participants there are, the more interesting the conversation. And so I truly mean it when I say I welcome the competition in the marketplace of ideas because that expands the marketplace of ideas. It makes it more interesting. It makes our product uh, the, uh, more sharp and more focused and expands the potential number of eyeballs. And so the news business and the entertainment business is to me one of those things because we're not just competing against other uh, news outlets. We're competing with uh, 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 what is it, World of Warcraft, or, 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 you know. or Succession. <laughs> <laughs> That's fiction. <laughs> That's entertainment. <laughs> but great question, really, really good question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please, here. So, so uh, again, just to repeat the question, and for those of you who don't know, when Viet was in the Bush administration after 9-11, he was one of the chief ar architects of what's been called the Patriot Act. And I think the question was, looking back now, Viet, we've now had more than 20 years, and also looking forward in terms of what's happening in the world today, maybe how do you think about the balance that was struck with that act? Yeah. And, and what are the implications moving forward as technology allows us to be much more intrusive in terms of surveillance than was certainly the case when you were thinking about those issues uh, in 2001? Right. Um, great question. But just as a matter of historical accuracy, a lot of what we now think of as the USA Patriot Act is not just the USA Patriot Act, which was a, a set of limited 40 provisions that we sent to Congress that was ultimately passed 99 to 1 by the, by the Congress nearly unanimously by the House of Representatives and has been you know, almost unanimously and consistently reauthorized by Congress for the, for the last two decades. It is a limited set of uh, uh, governmental powers and restrictions in order to ensure that we have all the legal tools that we needed uh, to prosecute the war uh, the, on terror. A whole lot of other activities happened after 9-11, uh, total information awareness, you know, detention and all, all that stuff. That is not, uh, not within the USA Patriot Act, but somehow has entered into the brand of the, the USA Patriot Act. But your point, is, your point is valid. The USA Patriot Act itself dealt with a lot of updating the technology, updating the law to the technology, because we had a lot of laws that were written in 1988, and obviously the internet in 2001 was a lot different. Since then, the last 25 years, it has grown even expon more exponentially. And so, uh, yes, it is a uh, it is a continuing uh, question. I do think that the you know people who are in place in government, people like you know we were talking about Lisa Monaco, who was the deputy attorney general, was uh, the, the in the department at the time. She was grappling with these issues uh, as uh, as I was. I'm sure her team is thinking about the uh, thinking about the, the, these things to to know how to have all the tools necessary to determine criminal and terrorist networks, but at the same time, protect the privacy and, uh, uh, and freedom of law-abiding uh, law citizens. Increasingly, it gets hard. I completely accept that, just as the practice of law gets increasingly uh, n n harder. David and I met when the world was paper and pen, yeah. and then now it's computers, and, and then it went from analog to digital, and now it becomes uh, the, the, the era of massive data. You know, I was, you know, I, I was amazed dealing with a case like uh, uh, with 25 million uh, uh, documents of which two or three emails you know, gets blown up and shows up in Vanity Fair. You have to understand, you know, like there is on the decision-making side, there is 
you know, two lawyers, Paul Clement and, uh, uh, and uh, Dan Webb, at the top of a tower of over 100 lawyers, because that's how many lawyers it takes in order to process a case of this size. Over here, looking at a mountain of 25 million pages of documents. That's, that's a practice of law that you and I are not familiar with. You know, we, and, uh, and, and by the time Dan goes into court, he has one, maybe two binders that gets, but the trick is how does Dan and Paul have the ability to access and understand and process these 25 million? You need that, the entire ability of that entire tower of decision makers to be able to process, search, and make evaluations of that entire mountain of 25 million pieces of data. That's just the practice of law. Think about that in terms of investigations. Think about that in terms of uh, 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 backward looking uh, uh, criminal uh, 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 investigations. Uh, think about that in all host of other areas of our society where uh, massive amounts of data are being ingested almost on a, on, on a second by second basis with the multitude of, uh, 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 of decision makers. I think that's, that's when technology also can help. Because you know now we have the ability to have, use AI in order to help us do some of that. Uh, some of that, I you know, I wish I had more of that uh, available uh, so that uh, I, as one of the people in the in the tower, can have access to one or two of those emails <laughs> and texts within that the, within that mountain. But I think uh, you know the the rules and the use of technology uh, uh, will hopefully help us uh, solve this uh, this issue because it is very very. Uh, not very, very hard. And, and you know, like I said, I complain about the fact that the 25 million should have been 5 million had there been a relevance re review. Uh, the, uh, and, and what are the rules that we impose on society, on legal processes, on uh, discovery, in order to make sure that the 24 million that does not belong is not exposed to the world for prurian or uh, or non-relevant uh, purposes, but I think you're, you're absolutely right, and that's why I, you know, I love the things like uh, the Center for Legal Prof uh, for Profession to allow us to think about the second order and third order issues, rather than just how do we process uh, the, these 25 million documents for the 100 decision makers, but actually think one level up on thinking about how how do we do that more efficiently, and then third level up, how do we do it in advance of the administration of justice, both criminal and civil. So we will be talking lots more about this over the course of the year and several years, and I hope that those of you interested in this will stay tuned because it's important for everything, as you said, immigration, for security, for surveillance, for privacy, but lawyers increasingly are in the middle of all of these discussions. Other, yes, please. Just to, again, sorry, to, just a report. No, no, but it's a great question. The essence of it is, uh, Viet had said that every on-air person and others get training in the First Amendment. Uh, the question really was, how are you training on the issue of malice, which is both a legal standard, but it's obviously also a, a judgment call. And has that training changed, particularly in light of the fact that in the settlement, there is an acknowledgement that the standard may have been met, and certainly whatever was acknowledged in the settlement, those people, whether the email should have been disclosed or not, a lot of what people read looked as though it might have been something at least that somebody should have been thinking about in terms of thinking about 
training for malice moving forward? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, the, just a point of clarification: we did not make that statement in the, the in the settlement. It was uh, uh, the, it was a statement that, that repeats what I say here. I think that we, despite the settlement, we are very proud of the work of the men and women of uh, uh, the Fox, especially Fox News, and uh, in no way. Uh, will it uh, the, the the settlement or any of uh, the associate uh, the associated developments uh, will it deter us from doing our job as uh, uh, as uh, practitioners and purveyors of First Amendment um, activity? We firmly believe in that duty and responsibility that we owe to the American uh, democracy. Of course, we have to do it responsibly, and that's why the, the training that we uh, that, that we go through. You're right. Malice is not. Uh, no, no, it's not about criminal malice. It's not evil of uh, the, the, the uh, forethought. It's not in criminal law, right? It's just, uh, uh, and it's certainly not in uh, not in the First Amendment. I think New York Times v. Sullivan puts it as the reckless disregard of the truth. Uh, and uh, the question then is how much uh, how much uh, uh, investigation do you have to do in order to uh, be not reckless? And and it varies from you. Absolutely, it varies from first from from situation to situation uh, and it varies from context uh, to publication and so and so quite often uh, we not only talk about the legal standards but because we're talking to professional reporters and not professional lawyers we have to put it into real world context you know this is this has been found as uh, 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 as malice, we bring up the, the the recent litigation against the New York Times uh, with Sarah Palin. You know, we we use a lot of these things, but while we all know that appellate cases are the corner solutions, mm -hmm. you know, the, the main is over here. And sometimes when you use appellate cases to teach, people forget that they're corner solutions. They're not the main. And so we talk through the, in the main of cases. Here is how. Uh, uh, here is how, what your responsibilities are. This is what. Uh, uh, the, the right thing to do, and these are the best practices. That's why we have media lawyers who represent a number of organizations who've seen these situations and advise on uh, on practical the, on practical issues. Flip to that, the recognition, if you will, that a lot of our laws relating to the First Amendment and uh, and uh, libel was developed at a time when news was in print. And when you, if you ever watch CNN or Fox or the, the, uh, or MSNBC, you can see that about half of the programming is guests appearing on shows. Even when we're doing the, the day part news, we invite guests to come on to comment about the news because it adds a whole level of complexity and uh, and richness. Uh, to engage the, the, the government. So no longer do you have Walter Cronkite reading the news 24 seven, it would be pretty darn boring, but you, uh, but, you, know, you have Harris Faulkner not, uh, bring, reading the news for like two minutes and then calling somebody else in to have a conversation about, uh, about the news. What are your duties before you put that guest on the, 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 on the air? Uh, uh, what happens when, the, when uh, uh, the guest says something unanticipated? Uh, uh, do you have a duty to correct? You know, all these things are live issues that we have to uh, that we have to uh, that we have to encounter. The courts the courts have said that you know in a call-in show you're not responsible for the you know some jackass calling in and saying something bad. But you know because you, you, so you don't you're not required to do a five second delay just on the off chance that somebody uh, the, the, the says something bad. But on the other hand, you know what happens when uh, when somebody is. Uh, the, uh, uh, making incendiary uh, 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 and false allegations uh, uh, that uh, may be repeated on on the air. We have mechanisms uh, 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 to deal with that. You know, a lot of news organizations do this. You know, they uh, uh, even on even on news conferences where maybe a former president is talking. You know, people will have will, will put in tape delays just in order to protect themselves and and not just protect themselves legally, protect the integrity of the product. Right, and so because that's that ultimately is what we're responsible for. We 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 don't like to think that lawyers make editorial or business decision. We like to think let the the reporters and business people make the best judgment of the uh, the, the uh, in consultation with legal counsel and not be dictated by uh, by 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 the lawyers.
Great Go question. Ahead. So let me just. Oh, you don't have to repeat that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the for the. For she the asked, "What do I think about apple pie yeah, yeah, and yeah, American yeah. flag?" No, she <laughs> asked a, a, a terrific question about how do you reconcile your role as a lawyer, protecting the interests of, uh, you know, Fox News and the organization that you're with, and the and its right to have its own opinion and reporters with your own personal experience of being uh, an immigrant, uh, a refugee, an Asian American, uh, in a time in which uh, it's at least fair to say that there has been a lot of uh, editorialization uh, against immigration, against uh, immigrants, uh, and many people, I think she used the word degrading of people, on the air, whether or not it's first amendmentally protected, I think she's asking you, how do you reconcile that as a as a human being? Right. Um, you brought up Anthony Lewis, so I'll start with an Anthony Lewis story. I love Gideon's trumpet because it's a story about a prisoner who handwrites his own petition and gets the Supreme Court of the United States not only to read it but to give it its due and recognize a right of redress uh, 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 for the petitioner. If you've ever been around the court, you know how improbable that is because you know the, the court takes in well nigh fifteen thousand uh, cert petitions a, a year. It hears maybe, I don't know what the current number is, probably 75 or so. And so that's a, that's a lot, a very big mountain with one handwritten, one handwritten uh, 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 petition. And Tony wrote it so well, drill, you know, uh, uh, as, I, uh, uh, as you put it, brings the whole humanity of our, not only of, the, uh, of Gideon, but, but also of our entire criminal justice system that allows for uh, 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 the least of us to be heard by the highest of the courts. After 9-11, when I was working on, actually after I already finished the USA Patriot, but I still was head, head of the legal policy, Tony, Tony called uh, call me and asked if he can come in and see me. I said, absolutely. So we talked about a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of things. And then and he said, he asked exactly your question in that context. He said, Viet, you are a immigrant, you are a refugee, you are a boat person. You've got everything from this the, the, uh, from this country, and how do you, how can you sit here and uh, 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 and do your job uh, to uh, oversee, implement the, 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 the you know the the the, uh, the xenophobia that's going on in policy uh, uh, across the administration? I looked at him point blank and I said, Tony, that's a great question. Uh, and it's a question I ask myself every day, and all of us as participants in the legal process, indeed, all of us as human beings living the, the life in America has to ask ourselves, which is how do we pay fealty to the principles that we believe in that got us to this point, and yet still be true to our profession as well as to our, uh, uh, as to our uh, the voice uh, uh, and integrity. Uh, I, I told uh, uh, Tony that I take the, the, the question uh, in the spirit it was uh, uh, asked, which was there was no uh, personal accusation or animus. Uh, all, that I, all that I can do is I promise you my utmost ability to do what I think is right, to serve my country in the hour of her greatest need with my limited abilities. Some of that people may disagree with. Some of it people may thank me for always we're in this together in order to help uh, not, not find uh, the right answer. Look at, we, we uh, at Fox News has 24 seven of a multitude of voices. Does that mean that I agree with every single uh, uh, minute of the air that, the, the, that we air? Of course not. I can't watch all 24 seven of it, but uh, the, does that mean, that the, and that diversity of voices is what makes the product good. You, that that what make for the the product. As I say, we have an editorial position at that is center right, but it a lot. But it would be very very boring if there is just somebody saying this is a center right position. Let's roll with it. It's all a, a spirit of uh, of debate of give and take, and that's what makes it encouraging and engaging. You will be very very. I don't have the numbers specifically with me, but more Democrats and independents, those self-identify as Democrats and independents, 
watch Fox News than not. So the majority of Democrats and independents say they watch Fox News other than uh, uh, our competitors. Now, some of that is just pure math, right? When you're number one, you're number one. The, 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 and so, but it says something when in our polarized society that you can have a product that for whatever reason, even people who may not agree with you actually watch and engage and, 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 and engage with. And that's the responsibility that we have is to not only to uh, uh, not to be available, but not to be entertaining and uh, and uh, engaging. So the only the, the best way that I can uh, answer your uh, question is I sleep very well at night, knowing that I've done my personal best in order to enhance the civil discourse in this country, uh, rather than degrade it. Uh, could we do better? Absolutely, one hundred percent. And uh, and that's part of the. These are the hard decisions that you know, uh, that we make as uh, not as uh, uh, certainly as business people, uh, but uh, uh, especially as lawyers. So Viet, I, I think that's a, a perfect note for us to end what, a conversation that I hope isn't the end, but at the beginning. Uh, we are at a perilous time in this country. Actually, I know you agree with this because you and I had dinner last night and we talked a lot about it and. Uh, that what is most at peril is exactly the idea of being able to have civil discourse around difference. And yet the differences are all only going to magnify as all the issues that we talk about become ever more complex. And, you know, as an educational institution, it is our, our, our responsibility to try to provide forums for that kind of uh, respectful disagreement and dialogue among our students and our alumni and those who are watching us online. Um, and it's why I'm very grateful that you agreed to come here, that you agreed to answer any questions that students have. And I just hope that you will continue to engage with us around these issues, because as you say, these issues are incredibly hard and they go to the very heart of what it means to be a lawyer and a citizen and a human being at this time. Um, so I want to thank all the students for the incredible questions that they raised. I hope that we will find ways to continue this kind of dialogue, not just on this issue, but on all of the issues that uh, we have to face in this world. So thank you very much. Fiona. Thank you, David. Thank you very I much. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.